Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine online webinar series. Today, Johns Hopkins breast imaging radiologist, Pepita Panagrahi, and mammography technologist, Ginger Hill, will be speaking about types of breast imaging. Before we get started, we'd like to provide some user tips so that you are comfortable using this platform. The first 30 minutes of our program will include an informative presentation by our presenters. The last 30 minutes will be dedicated to our live Q&A session. Please note this program is being recorded. To submit a question, please type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Your email address will not be shared with any third parties and we will do our best to answer all of your questions we received during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can email us questions and feedback to hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete our survey. A pop-up window will appear at the end of our program for you to complete the survey. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Panagrahi and Ginger Hill to begin our presentation. Hi, my name is Dr. Pani Grahi. I am a radiologist at Johns Hopkins, and I'm here today. I'm really excited to be presenting to you the different types of breast imaging and what's the difference. So we're gonna go over all the different types of breast imaging that you've heard from your doctors, and we'll talk about when each type of imaging is appropriate. I'm also uh, pleased to be joined by uh, Ginger Hill, who's one of our great radiation technologists, and I'll let her introduce herself as well. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, my name is Ginger Hill. I'm the Clinical and Operations Manager for Breast Imaging and a tech by trade. I'm really excited to talk about breast imaging and you know, give a lot of education. We have no disclosures. So this is the outline of our talk today. First, we're gonna go over an introduction to breast imaging. Then we will talk about all the different modalities you've heard about. So mammography, ultrasound, and MRI. And then we'll go over the indications for supplemental screening. And finally, we'll just touch on advanced breast imaging modalities and research topics that you might've heard of as well. So it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, it's October, and we just wanted to introduce breast cancer in general. So breast cancer affects one in eight women, and it is the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths, second to lung cancer. So on the left, uh, on the right side of your screen, you can see a side view of the breast, and this is what the breast is composed of. It's composed of adipose fatty tissue, and then ducts and lobules that make up the glandular tissue of the breast. So within these ducts and lobules, that's where breast cancer can form. The most common type of breast cancer is ductal carcinoma, but however, some cancers can also be lobular carcinomas, about 10 to 15%. So we, our goal in breast imaging is the early detection of breast cancers so that we can have the best treatment outcomes. Screening mammography is the only imaging modality that has been proven to decrease breast cancer deaths. And all the different imaging modalities that we're going to talk about today, including mammography, ultrasound, and MRI, all have specific indications. We're first going to talk about mammography. So a screening mammogram is for average risk women who are asymptomatic annually starting at age 40. Those are the recommendations that are put forth by the American College of Radiology and the Society of Breast Imaging, which are the two societies that we follow. Diagnostic mammogram, mammograms are a little different. They are for several reasons. First, if you have a breast symptom, so such as a breast lump, pain or discharge. So those symptomatic women who are greater than 30 years old or men who are greater than 25 years old may be eligible for a diagnostic mammogram. Diagnostic mammograms are also used for recalls from screening mammography or other type of imaging, such as CT, PET-CT or MRI. 
and also for follow-up of probably benign findings given a BIRADS 3 designation. Finally, at Hopkins, we do keep patients with a history of breast cancer in the past three years in the diagnostic pool so that we can monitor them closely shortly after they've had their surgery or treatment. Ginger is going to go over mammography techniques, and she's an experienced technologist. So mammography uses x-rays to generate images. Um, these, this x-ray is low, radi ro low radiation. And the types of mammograms that we have are 3D and 2D available. Um, Dr. Penagrahi will go into this a little bit more detail in the next slide, but in, in a nutshell, we like to explain that 3D is like looking at two loaves of bread, looking at a loaf of bread that's sliced. And if you have 3D imaging, you can take that slice away from the loaf of bread and look at it and put it back. Um, 2D is if you had that loaf of bread and you imaged it and it was not sliced. So you cannot take a specific slice out and look at it. Um, so this is how we explain to patients so that you can understand the differences between the different types of mammograms that are available to you. Um, with mammography, we offer screening and diagnostic like Dr. Penagrahi would just explained. And screening meaning that you're not having any new problems. This is just your annual follow-up, your normal checkup, like you would go to your regular physician and say, hey, I'm, I'm fine, but I just wanna make sure everything is doing really well. So with screening, our typical views are CC and MLO. And what that means is that the way we position your breast and the way that we're compressing you. And the paddle is going to, when we bring you up to the machine and bring you into the machine, the paddle is going to compress you coming from up above to pushing down on the breast. And our MLO view is pushing, the paddle is coming from the medial portion of your breast and pushing against the paddle, um, against the image receptor. So those are the two different views that we typically do on a screening. Sometimes you will have more than a CC and MLO, and that's just to make sure that the technologist is getting all of that breast tissue. So if you go to your annual appointment and you notice that you have more than just four images, two on each breast, you know that, okay, this is okay because they're making sure they're getting all of the breast tissue for the radiologist to read. Um, for a diagnostic, those same views are performed um, but if there is a specific problem, we do extra special views where we hone, like specifically look at those areas that you have a concern if you had a lump. So we use a different type of paddle and compress it in different views. And that helps the radiologist really see what's going on when we capture the image. Um, what you can expect just from start to finish is that a patient is going, you're going to come into the room. Your technologist is going to make sure that all of the equipment is clean for you. Um, after the equipment is clean, we asked you some questions about your breast health. We're gonna ask you about history of breast cancer. If you've had any surgeries, again, ask and specify, are you having any new problems today? So those questions will go over. Um, after we've done asked questions, we're going to bring you up and perform the actual exam. And after the exam, the technologist will explain to you um, what to expect next. If it's a screening, how you will get your results. If you're a diagnostic, we will explain that you, you're going to have a seat. You're going to wait while the radiologist um, interprets and make sure that we've got everything that we need. Um, so this just a Um, Ginger, I'm not sure if you cut out, but we'll go on to the next slide. Okay, so this is just a uh, schematic of tomosynthesis. A lot of patients ask, what is 3D? What's the difference? So on the left side of the screen, we have uh, how a tomo image is, is obtained. And you can see that instead of taking one picture, we're actually taking multiple pro low dose projections across the breast, usually about 15 or 16 projections while your breast is in compression. Those projection images are then converted into the slices that Ginger was talking about, like a loaf of bread where you can see through the slices. So that distinguishes just normal overlapping tissue from actual discrete masses. 
Um, so that's helpful for decreasing recall rates. And so after you have those slices, we also create a synthesized two-dimensional view of the mammogram. So we don't need to take an extra 2D mammogram in addition to the 3D projections that we've taken. So uh, this is a paper that uh, was uh, done by Emily Conan and colleagues in 2016. That was one of the large papers on tomosynthesis versus 2D mammography. And we uh, can see in the tables that the cancer detection rate was higher for tomosynthesis versus digital mammography, which is the same as 2D mammography. And the invasive cancers were also higher than those detected by 2D mammography. And invasive cancers are considered slightly more progressed than in situ cancers. So those are all better cancer detection outcomes with 3D. Um, the recall rate was also decreased, likely because we can distinguish between that overlapping tissue. And there was a slightly higher biopsy rate, but that is likely linked to the fact that we're detecting more cancers with 3D mammography. So this is just an example of a screening mammogram. So you can see, as Ginger was explaining, there are two views for each breast. On the left side of the screen, you can see the craniocaudal views and uh, the images are flipped for how the radiologist views it. So the left side of the screen is the right breast and then the right side of the screen is the left breast. And you can see on the left side of the screen, we have our craniocaudal views. And on the right side of the screen, we have our medial lateral oblique views. And we can see all parts of the breast using these two views. So what can you see on a mammogram and why do you need mammograms rather than ultrasound or MRI? So each imaging modality is optimized to see specific findings in the breast. For mammography, we can see masses, which we can also see on other modalities, but we can also see calcifications well, architectural distortion, which is when the tissue pulls in a little bit, and that you can't always see on other modalities, and asymmetries, so where there's patches of asymmetric breast tissue. So the last three are findings that are really best seen on mammography. This is an example of a diagnostic mammogram. So on the left side of the screen, you see a CC and MLO view on a patient's screening mammogram where they had new calcifications. This was called a BIRADS zero. BIRADS is the breast imaging reporting and data system that the American College of Radiology uses. And I'll touch on BIRADS. You'll always see that on the bottom of your mammogram reports um, or your ultrasound or MRI reports. And each number means a different thing. So BIRAD zero means we need additional imaging. So when we see something on a screening mammogram, we give the patient a BIRAD zero of a recall to come back for a diagnostic mammogram. On the right side of the screen, you can see that there are two specialized views that we obtained, which are called magnification views. Those are specialized to see calcifications in the breast. And these were considered suspicious coarse heterogeneous calcifications that were uh, biopsied as ductal carcinoma in situ. All right, so now we'll go on to ultrasound. So the indications for ultrasound are several. First, we use ultrasound in conjunction with mammography and other modalities when we're trying to evaluate findings seen on mammography or MRI or other imaging modalities. Ultrasound is also used for symptomatic patients, patients with palpable masses, pain, discharge, anywhere there's a focal symptom that we want to look with ultrasound. Specific populations also benefit from ultrasound rather than mammography. For the first group in younger patients where uh, there is a little bit more of a sensitivity to radiation, we do start with ultrasound, for example, in women less than 30 years old or in men less than 25 years old, we would start with uh, an ultrasound. There are also patients where a mammogram is not possible. So if a patient has had a mastectomy and they're feeling a lump in the mastectomy bed, then we would start with ultrasound because they can't have mammograms. Um, and then finally in pregnant patients, again, with the risk of radiation, we would start with ultrasound. And then finally, we'll at the end go over supplemental screening, but supplemental screening ultrasound is one other indication of ultrasound. 
So Ginger is going to talk about the technique of ultrasound. Thank you. So ultrasound uses reflection of sound waves to generate an image. So there's no radiation involved um, when performing an ultrasound. Uh, there are two types of ultrasound, handheld and automated breast ultrasound, which is also called ABUS. Uh, we at Johns Hopkins uh, do a handheld technique. Uh, we have, as you see in the picture, what you will expect when having a breast ultrasound is the area of concern is going to be scanned. So you're going to lay on your back, your arm's going to be placed behind your head, the area, the arm of the area of concern, the breast, and an ultrasound technologist will put some gel onto the breast, and then they use a transducer, which is what's being held um, in the hand, and they scan in different views to get the areas that we need for um, the radiologist to look at. And during that scan, where we could be doing multiple things, um, measuring the areas of concern, if there is something that is seen, or sometimes we're just measuring areas that are, you know, could be felt, but we want to show the, the radiologist so they can make a final interpretation. Okay, Dr. Panagrahi. All right. So let's go on to the findings that you can see on an ultrasound. So ultrasound is also optimized to see specific findings of the breast. Like mammography, you can see masses and the ultrasound is specialized for additional findings, including ducts behind the nipple. If there's a subtle mass that's in a duct behind your nipple causing nipple discharge, for example, an ultrasound would be best to truly visualize that as separate from a normal duct behind the nipple. Uh, lymph nodes are also best visualized on ultrasound. So if we see a prominent lymph node on mammography or MRI, we will always recommend an ultrasound to truly characterize that lymph node because we can see the difference between the fatty uh, center of the lymph node and the cortex that could mean that it's something suspicious. And finally, ultrasound can also characterize fluid collections very well. So if someone has had a breast cancer and then they have a post-operative seroma, that's something you can see best on ultrasound. If someone is having an abscess in their breast and it needs to be drained, that's something that we can see on ultrasound. This is an example of an ultrasound. So this patient had a history of prior breast surgery for a high-risk lesion. She had lobular carcinoma in situ, which is not cancer, but it's considered high risk for cancer in the future. Um, we, she actually had a negative mammogram within six months. So we started with ultrasound and saw this very subtle mass where she was palpating. It was a very ill-defined hypochoic area that you can see in the left side of the image with mild vascularity, which is the color flow around the, the dark spot, which is what she was feeling but it, it was very specific to the point she was feeling. It's sometimes hard to tell if something is scar tissue or if something is a true new mass. We did go to mammography and put a little triangle marker where she was feeling on her mammogram, but the mammogram was pretty stable in that area of post-surgical change. Because she had the symptom, we did biopsy this area. This came back as invasive lobular carcinoma which is notoriously known for being very subtle on, on all imaging modalities. So it highlights the importance of any change in a palpable finding in your breast to come in and have it evaluated because it can be very subtle. So because it was invasive lobular carcinoma, which is hard to detect and see, we, she did get an MRI scan to see what was a true extent of this abnormality and you can see on the right side of the image, this is a MIP MRI image. You can see a large area of non-mass enhancement in the right upper outer breast, which was exactly where she was feeling and the site that was biopsied as a lobular carcinoma. She went on to have a right mastectomy to remove the area of concern. This was called a BIRADS-4 at the time of biopsy to recommend the biopsy. And then it was called a BIRAD-6 at the time of the MRI because she already had known biopsy proven malignancy at that time. So the last, uh, the last modality we're gonna go over is MRI. 
So why do we use MRI? So in this, you just saw an MRI for extent of disease for newly diagnosed breast cancer. Um, that is one of the reasons we use MRI. Another reason is if the patient already has a known breast cancer and they get neoadjuvant chemotherapy, meaning they get chemotherapy before going on to surgery, that's also a, an indication for MRI to see how they have responded to that chemo, if the, if the tumor has shrunk or not. Um, MRI is also used for additional evaluation of clinical and imaging findings. So if a patient has a metastatic lymph node in the axilla and there's no known breast primary, that would be an indication for MRI to try to find that primary cancer. And pathologic nipple discharge is another reason to get an MRI. So if the patient has had a mammo and an ultrasound for nipple discharge, but there wasn't any finding, yet it's pathologic, meaning it's clear or bloody nipple discharge coming out spontaneously from one nipple, all those things are something that's pathologic, uh, that would be a reason to recommend an MRI. Uh, finally, high-risk screening, we'll go over that at the end when we talk about supplemental screening, that is one indication for MRI. And finally, implant integrity evaluation. If you have had silicone implants, the FDA recommends that uh, we get an implant protocol MRI three years after initial implantation and every two years thereafter. Not everyone gets it at that frequency, but that is what the FDA has, has, um, has mentioned is appropriate to evaluate if there's any silent implant rupture. And the, all of the, uh, the indications listed, the first four are contrast enhanced exams. The last implant integrity evaluation does not need to be a contrast enhanced exam. It's actually a non-contrast exam. And we'll talk about that during the technique. So Ginger will talk about the technique of MRI. Yes, thanks. So MRI uses magnetic fields and radio waves to generate an image. Again, this is another modality that is not using radiation. Um, most of our exams, uh, like Dr. Penegrat, he said, use IV gadolinium contrast. And what this does is when we go to image the breast, we the areas of uh, the gadolinium will highlight areas of concern in the breast for the radiologist to see it, if there's anything really going on. Um, in, in areas we would use non-contrast um, is not diagnostic for breast cancer, but may be used to evaluate a silicone um, implant integrity or possible rupture. Um, what to expect when you have a breast MRI? First, when you arrive to your appointment, you will go through a series of questions with the um, technologist or staff uh, to make sure that you are safe before going in. So this will include um, your health history to make sure that when we take you into the MRI, there is nothing that will harm you or cause you harm. Um, so, and after that series of questions is done, we will ask a little bit about your breast history as well um, to make sure that the reason we're doing the exam or what has happened in your past history as far as surgical history and so forth. Um, once the questioning is done, they will um, move on to move you onto the table. For this exam, you are laying on your stomach with your arms above your head, as you can see in the picture. Um, where you see the patient laying on is we call a breast coil. And with the breast coil is that what that does is help us stabilize the breast so that it doesn't cause motion on our images. And the breast coil pretty much fits the breast. There, there is a very small compression, not hard, very light compression just to help stabilize the breast so that when we scan, like I said, you're not having any movement. Um, once you're positioned, you will go into um, the MRI unit and you will hold very still while, while the technologist scans. And once you're done, you're released. Dr. Panagrahi? All right. So let's go over what you can see on an MRI and how it's different than mammograms and ultrasounds. So MRI is optimized to see specific findings. It can also see masses just like mammography and ultrasound. But the things that only MRI can see are areas of non-mass enhancement. So if there's nothing on the mammogram or ultrasound, 
there might be something on the MRI in patients who are at high risk for breast cancer, or we're trying to see if there's anything else involved for a patient who has a known diagnosis of breast cancer, you may see that in your report, an area of non-mass enhancement. There are also enhancing foci that are small, less than five millimeters that show enhancement on the MRI and may not have a correlate on mammograms or ultrasounds. And then as uh, Ginger mentioned, we can use non-contrast MRI to evaluate silicone implants to evaluate for that silent rupture where you might not be feeling anything clinically, but if you wanna get the implant checked out, you can have the MRI to see if there's any silicone signal that appears abnormal and not within the normal implant capsule. So this is an example of a diagnostic MRI and the steps that it took to get to that MRI stage. So this was a patient who was ha um, having suspicious right nipple discharge. She was having bloody nipple discharge for several months and came in to our breast imaging department and got first a mammogram and an ultrasound. So for suspicious nipple discharge, we start with the mammogram then we get specialized views with the mammogram, including magnification views, like we talked about before, which can highlight calcifications in the breast. And this patient did not have any calcifications on her mammogram magnification views and did not have anything suspicious on the mammogram. And our next step is to go to ultrasound. So we did a targeted ultrasound of the retro areolar region, which is right behind the nipple, to see if there was anything within the ducts within the breast there that was causing this nipple discharge. There was nothing on the mammogram or the ultrasound. This was called a BIRADS-1 negative. However, it still had, she still has a suspicious nipple discharge. And this is where the clinical history is very important and comes in because the radiologist recognized that this was pathologic discharge despite negative imaging the radiologist recommended that she did have a diagnostic breast MRI. So you can see on the right side of your screen, this was her breast MRI MIP image. And you can see this large area of segmental heterogeneous non-mass enhancement in the right upper outer breast, which is where, um, where uh, the side, which was the side of her nipple discharge. So this was considered suspicious. Because it was such a large area, they ended up doing a two-site MRI biopsy because the area was only seen on MRI. And both sites came back as ductal carcinoma in situ. This is an example of um, a diagnostic indication of MRI that it's in our tool toolbox if we need for patients who have suspicious clinical symptoms. So supplemental screening. You've pro all probably heard of dense breast tissue and MRIs and ultrasounds. Who gets what? Uh, it's still a topic of research and it's still a topic of, um, of, of that's not clear of this is the exact protocol that needs to happen for everyone who needs supplemental screening. But in general, supplemental screening ultrasound may be indicated for patients who have dense breast tissue and we'll show you what that means when you get that report that says you have dense tissue. And supplemental screening MRI may be indicated in patients who have a strong family history of breast cancer that puts them at a greater than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer, a personal history of breast cancer, especially if it's premenopausal breast cancer, certain genetic mutations like the BRCA1 or 2 mutations, and that would start at age 25 and a history of chest radiation, for example, mantle radiation of the chest for lymphoma when a patient was a teenager, if they had that less than 30 years old, that would put them at high risk for breast cancer. And the lifetime risk, so this 20% is, is, um, is a percentage that's calculated by various risk assessment models. And you can talk to your doctor if you think that you're, you might be at high risk and they can go through all of these different models to see what is your percentage lifetime risk of breast cancer. So when we say density, what does that mean? So here you can see four categories of breast density from left to right. We have breasts being almost entirely fatty. Then there are scattered areas of fibroglandular density then there are breasts that are heterogeneously dense that may obscure small masses. And then there are extremely dense breasts that lower the sensitivity of mammography. You can see on the right, it's almost like a whiteout. If there was a mass hiding in there, it would be very hard to see. 
This is a great paper that was uh, recently published uh, for screening algorithms in dense breasts, which is exactly what we're talking about by Wendy Berg and her colleagues. This is a great figure in her paper that shows how difficult it can be to see these breast cancers when the breasts become more dense. And so from left to right, you can see all of these where the arrows are ended up being invasive ductal carcinomas. But on the rightmost image, that breast cancer almost blends with the extremely dense surrounding breast tissue. And this is where a screening ultrasound or MRI would come in and would be, have been very helpful to find that breast cancer when it's smaller and more treatable. All of these were ended up being treated, but, uh, but the, the less amount of fibroglandular tissue is present in the breast, the easier it is to see those breast cancers pop out on the, on the mammogram. Um, this is a kind of complicated chart, but it's something that your doctor can use for step-by-step um, -step going through, do you need supplemental screening? So you should have the conversation with your doctor by the time you're about 30 years old, if you've had a strong family history of breast cancer and there's a question of the genetic mutation going on. If you do have genetic mutations, supplemental screening could start at age 25 with MRI and age 30 with mammograms. And as you go down this flow chart, um, it goes in to all the different things that can increase your risk of breast cancer. So if at some point along the way, you've been diagnosed with something called atypia, so atypical ductal hyperplasia or atypical lobular hyperplasia, that might put you at increased risks. That might make you qualify for an annual MRI in addition to your mammograms. All of these supplemental screening modalities are in addition to mammography if you're over the age of 30. And so that means that you would get your mammogram and then ideally six months later, you would get an MRI and that is an alternating situation. Some patients also choose to get their mammogram in addition to an ultrasound at the same time. And so the best, uh, the best screening modality is still being researched and it's something that requires discussion with your doctor to figure out what's best for you. So this is an example of supplemental screening ultrasound. This patient had extremely dense breasts and a history of papillomas. So because she uh, had that high-risk lesion in the past, she decided to get screening ultrasound in conjunction with her mammograms every year. And this was a negative exam. It was a BIRADS2 benign because she did have some biopsy clips in there from her prior benign biopsies, but there was nothing new or suspicious on her imaging. And this is an example, our final example of supplemental screening MRI. In 2020, this is a BRCA1 mutation patient in her late 20s. She started getting supplemental screening MRI at age 25 around there because she had known mutation because of strong family history of women with breast cancer in her family. Uh, her 2020 screening breast MRI was negative. She then got pregnant and she felt a lump so she missed her 2021 screening breast MRI. But when she felt the lump, she did come in for ultrasound and you can see a very suspicious mass, BIRADS5, highly suspicious mass that she was feeling in her left upper outer breast. When she delivered, she did get her MRI and you can see how big that mass is and how much can happen when you have a high risk genetic mutation as well as pregnancy that does put you at increased risk of breast cancer. This came back as an invasive ductal carcinoma. And finally, two things we don't really do at Hopkins routinely is nuclear medicine techniques. You can have gamma cameras that are depicting sestamibi uptake or PET CTs, PET PEM, um, positive positron emission mammography that can detect FDG uptake so those are two techniques that are still in the research stage in a lot of places and have a, a, some different challenges like imaging time, whole body radiation, availability. Uh, so that is, however, one, one uh, modality that can also show breast cancers. And finally, contrast enhanced mammography is something we also are in um, the research stage for and we don't routinely perform at, at, at Hopkins, but it is another modality that is performed after injection of IV um, iodine-based contrast. And that can also show areas of enhancement similar to MRI 
that are abnormal in the breast. And a couple of challenges with that imaging modality is the radiation is twice the amount as a normal mammogram because you have to do it before and after IV contrast. And also some people have slightly higher contrast reactions with iodine-based contrast media versus the gadolinium-based contrast media that's used in MRI. All right, so we've talked about breast imaging and how it is used for early detection of breast cancers when they're most treatable. We've talked about the most prominent imaging modalities that have specific indications and that are optimized to see specific findings in the breast. And screening mammograms are the only modality that have been shown in research to decrease breast cancer deaths. And that's why we do recommend that for all of our patients who are eligible. And we want you all to talk to your doctor to see if supplemental breast imaging is something that might be appropriate for you based on your, your personal and your family history. These are my references. And thank you for your attention. We're gonna go to the next uh, phase of the talk with the Q&A session. All right, I'll read the first question. So question number one, what if I have breast implants, what exam is right for me? Um, do you want, or I, I can answer that, do you wanna? Okay, um, so, so if you have breast implants, um, you, we still recommend that you get screening mammograms. We have specific implant protocols for our uh, mammograms, which Ginger can talk about, but basically it's doing implant displaced views and implant in place views. And that allows us to kind of separate the breast tissue from the implant, but we still recommend mammography. Implants do lower the sensitivity of mammography. So if you have dense breasts in addition to the implants, you may benefit from something like a screening breast ultrasound in addition to the mammogram if you have dense breasts. In addition, if you have a family history of breast cancer or something that would put you at that greater than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer, you could talk to your doctor to see if you qualify for a supplemental screening MRI in addition to mammograms, but that's something that, um, that is only for patients who have a strong uh, risk of breast cancer in, right now, just because of the availability of MRI. Okay. Question number two, can ultrasound be used instead of mammography to avoid radiation exposure? So yeah, I get this question a lot from patients because it's not fun to have a mammogram um, from what I've heard. And so uh, I, the answer is unfortunately no. Um, like we talked about, there are specific imaging findings that you can only see on a mammogram even if you have dense breasts, even if you, you know, don't think that, even, even if it lowers the sensitivity of, your mem of mammography with dense breasts, there are things that only mammograms can see. Th those include calcifications, architectural distortion, and asymmetries. So each imaging modality is tailored to see specific things and screening mammography is the only thing that has been proven to decrease breast cancer death. So we still recommend that you get your screening mammogram. Very good. Number three, is doing two mammograms within six months harmful? So um, it's a very low dose of radiation that's used for mammography. It's similar to background radiation uh, for a couple of months in the year. So it's actually not considered harmful if you're within that age range. And sometimes we do recommend patients get a follow-up mammogram at six months usually not within six months, but usually if it's at six months. So if you have a BIREDS three, probably benign finding, all of the studies have shown you would have a follow-up in six months with a potential mammogram at that time. And that is fine. That's within the, uh, the radiation uh, requirements for, for mammography. Okay. Any thoughts on accelerated MRI? Is it useful? Will that be the future of breast imaging? Yeah, so abbreviated protocol MRI would be great. Um, it's something that hasn't been implemented everywhere yet. We did a study on, um, on the sequences that would be included in an abbreviated protocol MRI a couple years ago at Hopkins showing that it had 
um, equivalent cancer detection rate as, as the full protocol MRI. And basically you don't need to take as many sequences um, after the contrast and administration, you would only take one post-contrast set of images. So it can decrease your imaging time. And that's the biggest, um, the biggest block in MRI being widely available is that the magnets are expensive and it's, uh, it, it does, it's a very involved exam that takes a lot of time. So um, if we could do abbreviated protocol, that might be something that is, is a future direction and they do at some places. And uh, that's something that we would like to move toward, but it still is a topic of research. How often should women old, older than 55 be screened? So the ACR and the SBI recommend yearly annual mammograms. They do not um, have an end date for that. And uh, I know a lot of the other societies like um, the American Cancer Society and the USPTF are, uh, have given different screening guidelines and it can be confusing for the patients. But given that we know we see a lot of breast cancers in patients over 55, um, we still recommend annual screening mammography based on the American College of Radiology and the Society of Breast Imaging recommendations. Okay. Should I still get mammograms after mastectomy or lumpectomy? Definitely after lumpectomy, because that means that they didn't take out the whole breast, that only, they only took out part of the breast. And patients who've had a history of breast cancer for, and had a lumpectomy thereafter, have an increased risk of breast cancer in the future, regardless of if you got radiation or neoadjuvant chemotherapy or chemotherapy, you still have an increased risk of breast cancer. So it's very important if, you'd, if you've had a lumpectomy to continue your annual screening mammography. And in terms of a mastectomy, should you still get mammograms? So when they re do a mastectomy, they take out all the breast tissue. So there's nothing there anymore. To, uh, to image on the mammogram. So you don't need to get mammograms on that side, but if you still have your other breast, you still need to get the mammograms on the other breast that's still there because just like post lumpectomy patients, if you've had a history of breast cancer, even status most post mastectomy in one breast, you do have an increased risk of breast cancer in the breast that was not removed. So um, in terms of the screening of the mastectomy breast that was removed, that is clinical evaluation and follow-up. So if you feel a new lump or your doctor feels a new lump when they're doing your yearly checkup and they want you to be evaluated, you would come in and we would start with an ultrasound of the anywhere you're feeling at the in that mastectomy side. Okay. Will I ever need more than one ultrasound for the doctors to reach a diagnosis? So that's a good question. Sometimes breast imaging can be complicated in that you may have to go back and forth between imaging modalities. So um, I'm not sure what specific situation you're asking about, but for example, if you had a breast cancer diagnosed on a mammogram, you had a biopsy, it was breast cancer, then they got an MRI to evaluate extent of disease and they saw other spots. So a potential mass somewhere else in the breast or a lymph node that was enlarged in your armpit area, then you might have to come back to ultrasound, getting another ultrasound to evaluate additional areas of, um, of uh, disease. And in terms of getting additional ultrasounds, if you've had something biopsy that was benign, we also do follow-ups, uh, usually a year after a benign biopsy, just to make sure that there's no changes at that site. And if there is any changes on that second ultrasound, we would let you know. Okay. What are your thoughts on risk assessment and genetic testing? How early should I start? How early should it start for women? And what risk models are the gold standard? So I'm not a genetic specialist, so I can't say which is the best risk assessment uh, uh, model. Uh, there are several, and we do have a genetic counseling, um, counselors at Hopkins, as well as breast surgeons who are able to calculate your lifetime risk. There's the Tyra Kruzik model and there's the Gale model that are the two most commonly used models for breast cancer risk assessment. In terms of when you should start getting um, your risk assessment evaluated, 
if you have a strong family history of breast cancer and you know that there's been premenopausal breast cancer in your mom, your grandmother, maternal aunt, if there's any male breast cancer in the family, that's something you should talk to your doctor about. Um, if you know that there's a known diagnosis of BRCA, like we said in the supplemental screening slides, supplemental screening would start at age 25 for getting screening breast MRIs because women in their 20s can get breast cancer if they have that predisposition. And so um, it's important to start early in your 20s and 30s um, before you're supposed to start your normal screening mammograms at age 40 in, if you are in the patient population that has this strong family history and you're concerned that there might be a genetic component of cancers running in your family. Very good. Um, what exams do I not need a physician order for? Um, I can answer this. So you do need an order um, for any type of diagnostic exam, meaning that there is some type of finding or some type of follow-up that is needed and you do need a, a physician that can follow your care. You do not need an order for a screening mammogram. Annual screenings can be done. You can, as long as they're done annually, you can refer yourself to go get your annual screening. If from your annual screening, there is some type of finding, your doctor would get that report. And from there, your doctor would write an order to follow up. Okay. Um, number 11, I hear a lot of differing opinions on the age and frequency to start screening. Can you clarify? Yeah, so um, the age and frequency to start screening, as I mentioned, is something that is uh, confusing for patients because of all these different recommendations out there for, um, for do you start at 40, do you start at 45, is it every year, is it every two years? So we follow the Society of Breast Imaging and the American College of Radiology, which are radiologists who are the people, the doctors who are reading the breast imaging, who are diagnosing these breast cancers. And we recommend starting at age 40 and then annually thereafter. Um, I know that it's confusing because some of the other societies say start at 45 and then start, do it every two years. Um, but we at Hopkins follow the SBI and the ACR guidelines of starting at age 40 and then doing it yearly thereafter. What safety protocols do you have in place? And can you touch on the protocols for those who recently received the vaccine? When should I have my mammogram? Ginger, you could probably. Yep. Yeah. So safety protocols. So we, we right now will make sure with when you go to schedule your mammogram, we are asking patients if they've had a recent vaccination. We right now recommend um, four to six weeks after your last COVID vaccination. Um, I know it's been a new question with boosters. So if you are getting your first round of COVID vaccinations that require two doses, you would wanna wait till after that second dose and you would wait four to six weeks after that dose to have screening mammography. If you're having a problem, we still recommend that you come in, even if you did just recently have the vaccination, because we want to make sure that we're assessing that as it could be something very serious. Um, but we, again, with booster, it's the same thing. If you've received your booster vaccination, you want to wait four to six weeks to um, continue your screening mammography. And we're asking that question when you go to schedule and when you come in, we're verifying when you've had your vaccination and documenting that so that the radiologist is able to see when you've had your vaccination, which arm you've had your vaccination in so we can assess properly. Um, is there more radiation used in a diagnostic mammogram versus a screening mammogram? So the answer is it depends. It depends on um, what views you get for the diagnostic mammogram and how many views are required to truly clear a finding or to demonstrate that it's a suspicious finding. But uh, it's uh, probably about the same as that, that side for the screening mammogram. It just depends on how many views we get. On the screening mammogram, we get two standard views, which is CC and MLO. And then depending on the finding for the diagnostic mammogram, for example, if it's calcifications, we have to do magnification views. 
if it's an asymmetry or a mass, we may have to do spot compression views. And then for all the patients, we usually do a true lateral view. So the answer is it depends, but it's all within the accepted radiation dose. Yep, very good. If I am still breastfeeding, should I wait to have a mammogram? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, if you're over 40 and you're still breastfeeding, you should still have your mammogram. Uh, what patients usually do is we usually tell patients to empty before the mammogram because when you are breastfeeding, it greatly increases the amount of fibroglandular tissue and the because of the ducts and the breast are distended. So it does make the mammogram a bit harder to read because you are going to be more dense while you're breastfeeding compared to your, uh, your baseline state. But uh, we would still recommend to get the mammogram because there are things that you can see on the mammogram, such as calcifications or distortion, even within dense tissue that may require further evaluation. And um, this question, I think we've kind of touched base on, it's probably gonna be a little bit of the same answer. Uh, I have been treated for breast cancer and I'm nervous about the sensitivity and pain during a mammogram. Could an ultrasound be an alternative? Yeah, so we, we touched on this a bit. Unfortunately, um, we still would recommend that you have the mammogram. Um, some patients who've had premenopausal breast cancer and have dense breast tissue may also get supplemental screening breast MRIs. MRIs in general are great as a supplement to, to mammograms, but in uh, it does the screening breast ultrasound and screening breast MRI does increase the what's what we call the false positive rate. So it sometimes it can pick up things that are actually normal and result in biopsies that end up being benign. So that's just something to consider. But um, we still recommend that you would get your mammogram, if, especially if you've had a history of breast cancer. And the technologists sometimes note that the patient was sensitive and they do the compression as much as the patient can tolerate. And um, maybe Ginger, you can touch on that, on how we, we try to you know, communicate with our patients when we're doing the mammogram to make sure that they're comfortable. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I think that's one thing that uh, um, most mammographers and I can, I can speak for our division of breast imaging, our mammographers are really great in, in really working with the patient and you to make sure that you're comfortable and there are techniques that we can work. We do have to get compression because compression helps us stabilize the breast so that it's not um, creating motion or that the doctor can get a really good clear picture to interpret. So we do have to use the compression paddle, but there are different techniques that we can use. There are just certain paddles that we can use and education for our technologists to, to really work with you and, and reach that comfortable spot where we can actually get an image. So it, it's a really great point, Dr. Fenegrahi, to bring up that we, we really do work with the patient to make you comfortable. Um, how is an ultrasound guided breast biopsy performed? Um, so that's a great question. When we say you need a biopsy, what are you signing up for? Um, so an ultrasound biopsy is actually the most comfortable biopsy, I would say, for patients uh, because you're lying down on the on a table just the same as when you're doing your diagnostic ultrasound to find the mass or whatever we, we're recommending for biopsy. So you would go back to the same room that you had the diagnostic exam, the diagnostic ultrasound in, and just as we were looking with our transducer to find the lesion, we will use that transducer as our guide um, to do the biopsy. So we find the spot with the ultrasound probe, we clean your skin, we numb with lidocaine and the skin and deeper inside. And then we go in with our biopsy device, take a couple of samples and place a little clip there afterwards that marks the spot. So if it's anything that needs to be removed by a surgeon, they know where to go to take the whole thing out. If it's benign, the clip would stay in the breast and it's just a marker for your future exams that you've had that area biopsied. The whole thing, they allot an hour for each site, but the actual procedure time is usually only 15 to 20 minutes. Can a partner join me for a breast MRI? What if I'm claustrophobic? Ginger, I don't know if you wanna talk on the current policies. 
Yeah, I mean, currently for most facilities, we do not have someone join you in the room unless there are medical necessity or need to have someone join you in the room. Um, and for claustrophobic, uh, you definitely want to speak with your primary care physician or referring physician about this as there are medications that you can take to help with the claustrophobia and that, you know, we have instructions when you come to your appointment, when you do take these type of medications so that we keep you safe. All right, our last question. How quickly will I get the results from a breast MRI? And so that is usually within one day of your exam. Sometimes you get the same day. It just uh, depends on our uh, our diagnostic schedule and the uh, how we how we divide up our exams. But it's usually within uh, 24 hours you'll have your results. If it's on the weekend, then you might have to wait till Monday. Very good. All right. Well, I think that was the last question. Um, thank you, Amy and Asmina, for putting this together, and Ginger for speaking with me from for the frontline view as a technologist and operations manager. So thank you very much to all of our viewers for joining us today. We hope this provided you with a little more information and in this Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And please reach out with, to us if you have any other questions. Thank you. Thanks.